Yeah, sure. So hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this crash course series on geriatric medicine. Um, and today we'll be taught by Dr. Nitish Sharma, um, who is going to go through some slides and some questions with us in a moment. Um, in the top corner of the slide there, you can see the link to our Instagram. So please give us a follow and um, you can get the latest updates on all our upcoming sessions um, and see what we're up to in the next year. And then also there's our email at the bottom there as well. If you want to get in touch, ask any questions um, and yeah, that would be great. So if you could move on to the next slide, please. So this is the link to our poll this evening. So if I could ask you all to scan the QR code now um, and then when the questions come up on the slides, you'll be able to answer as we go along. I'll just give it a minute. Yep. OK, great. So let's get started. Nitish, I'll leave it with you. OK. Hi, everyone. I'm Nitish. I am a GP trainee in Southwest London. Um, I'm going to uh, start the course uh, teaching course on geriatrics now. This is the part two. I believe you already had the part one. OK. OK, so we'll be starting with the falls, which is the most common presentation in elderly. I mean, in, in geriatric wards, uh, I, I think most of the patients are um, just coming with the fall. No other presenting complaint. So yeah, so that's just a bit of epidemiology. Um, <clears throat> leading cause of mortality in people aged greater than 75, um, 400,000 people uh, attend a &E just for falls, and out of uh, and 14,000 die due to ortho uh, orthoprotic hip fractures from these falls each year, and almost 5% of these falls uh, need hospitalization. So you can see it's a big number, even 5% five, uh, 5 of 4,000, 400,000. OK, so what are the risk factors? So previous falls, if somebody has had a fall previously, they are more, more likely to have another fall. There are multiple of reasons uh, for that, and we'll be going through that um, some uh, at some point later in this uh, course. Um, females are more prone to falls, and obviously as you get older, you, are, you get more prone to falls, especially after the age of 80. Um, disorders of gait and balance, people with uh, Parkin Parkinson's and uh, other balance problems are more likely to have falls. Uh, visual impairment, ca again cataract, very common in elderly, leading cause of falls. Uh, cognitive impairment, confusion, any delirious patient um, is more prone to falls. Um, high dependence of uh, high dependence for ADLS. So um, in cases where patient might be otherwise fit. I mean, not fit, but uh, with no other comorbidities like balance problem or cardiac problem, but they do need help with their ADLS. For example, bathing, washing, they might become dependent on that and uh, they may become more prone to falls when they do anything uh, independently. Um, OK, foot problems and inappropriate footwear. I mean, it's quite uncommon reason for falls, but yeah, it could be. Um, arthritis, uh, low limb weakness, stroke, Parkinson's, polypharmacy, another another very common cause, uh, polypharmacy. So especially in elderly, we see people who've been seen by different specialists again and again and been prescribed loads of medications and these medications haven't had a review in a while. So which basically causes interactions and between medications and also uh, causing the falls. Alcohol, uh, not very common, but yeah. Environmental factors, causes of mechanical falls like loose carpet, slippery floor, um, infections causing delirium, causing weakness, um, causing the falls. Um, use of walking aids. Uh, so this this is basically cause of uh, mechanical falls. Yeah. OK, so you see a patient in a &E, or your med uh, asks you to go and see a patient who has been uh, referred to you for a fall. How do you start with it? So 
history how was how, how how did it happen was the loss of consciousness so when i say how did it happen so you basically take history in three parts which gives it a nice structure so you start with what were you doing before the fall what happened during the fall and what happened after the fall so for what happened during the fall you need to ask if there's a loss of consciousness if uh, how long did they did it last and how long they were on the floor who came to help them and for after the fall uh, you need to ask about confusion any headaches loss of function any vomiting these all will tell you about if there's any head injury or something serious going on okay so now you're done in the done, done with the history we go on to examination um start with the basic vitals uh heart rate, temperature, uh, saturation, uh, blood pressure, the most important. Uh, do a min mini mental state examination just to see that there's uh, no uh, chances of brain injury, nothing pointing towards brain injury. Then you see for any bruising, uh, look out for any uh, injuries, um, any reduced function. By that I mean we need to rule out the stroke as a cause of fall. Um, any confusion, postural BP, as I mentioned in the vitals, uh, uh, BP very important, and it is most common cause uh, in people with polypharm uh, in elderly with polypharmacy. Uh, pulse neurology, so yeah, very important again neurology just to rule out that stroke is not the cause of fall. Have a look at the uh, fundi ocular exam. No one really does it, but ideally needs to be done. Um, vision testing. I mean, not not in emergency or any setting, but yeah, lay some some point later in the stage. OK, so how would you investigate this? Uh, so first of all, if there are any risk factors, then investigations for those, but start with the routine investigations, full blood count, U and E, uh, LFTs, TFT, TFT, very important. Uh, B12 glucose again B12 could cause neuropathy which could cause the falls uh, urinal uh, urine analysis uh, which is very important because um, UTI is very common in elderly urosepsis is very common in elderly ECG because arrhythmias are the most common cause uh, of falls and in them uh, bradyarrhythmias are the most common cause um, and if you go further in bad arrhythmias, it's first degree heart block. That's the most common cause. OK, then you go in on to echo. I mean, some point later in the stage, not something that you need to just at that time. Uh, specialist assessment, again, something that needs to be done uh, later, uh, later at, at some point later. OK, so treatment, how do you treat? So before treating the core, uh, I mean, we do need to treat the cause, but we need to treat the what emergencies might have uh, been caused because of the fall. For example, fractures, uh, very common uh, in elderly, subdural hematoma, uh, basic, uh, I mean, basically emergencies, uh, pneumonia, hypothermia, UTI and dehydration. As I mentioned, UTI is very common cause, so yeah, keep an eye. I always make sure that you do uh, your analysis for any elderly coming with fall. OK, so falls assessment. So how do you uh, do the assessment? Very commonly you will have a uh, once you start working as a foundation doctor, you will have a very common bleep saying from from the nurses saying that this patient has uh, uh, fallen on the ward and come and do the falls assessment. So how do you do so? Take a very good history what the patient, as I mentioned uh, before, during and after what the patient was during do, doing before the fall. Uh, what uh, sorry before the, for the fall and then what, what happened during the fall? Was there any loss of consciousness? Was there any energy um, injury? Was there any uh, abnormal body movements? Was there any vomiting? And then what happened after the fall? Was the patient able to remember everything? Was there any confusion, headache, vomiting, any injuries that the Nurses could appreciate, or the patient, or you can appreciate. Um, then you do uh, your basic vitals, and uh, then you start with the examination. Do a get examination. It's most likely that the fall was because of the gait or balance problems, rather than anything else in the hospital. And because in the hospital, we'll talk about this in a bit. Uh, this immobility in the hospital, which causes muscle weakness and leads to the phones. Um, 
osteoporosis risk. This is something that not does not need to be done urgently, but some point later. Um, fear of falling. This is very important. So uh, sometimes uh, elderly patients who come come in with a fall might be treated very well and their medical problem has gone away completely but they still might uh, have a fear of falling just because of that um, incident so here is where our colleagues in physiotherapy and occupational therapy come in to help them we'll talk about this in detail in a bit visual impairment uh, yeah very important check for visual impairment at that point uh, cognitive impairment neurological Logical exam again, very good. Luck. There's no stroke or anything uh, intracranial going on. Um, continence, uh, just rule of UTI, home hazards. This is something when a patient comes for any cardio uh, arm, very important. Once you very important. So, see a patient with a falls in the wards, you need to do a very good history of falls. Um, it's a basic examination, vitals, uh, neurological exam, cardiovascular exam, and uh, medication review. Very important. Most people miss the medication review, but it's really very important because most of the times they are taking some uh, bisoprolol or taking a two anti or two or three antihypertensives, which have not been reviewed and uh, has caused a uh, postural drop while in the hospital because when they are having some medical problem and on top of polypharmacy that really complicates things and makes them more prone to the folds. OK, so our first uh, SPA, um, so 80 year old female presents to ED with a fall. The patient is a nursing home resident. Um, history from the patient and collateral. So patient had two to three folds over the past few days. Sudden falls, blackouts, so there's a loss of consciousness. Uh, last lasts a few seconds, no abnormal body movements, um, no in incontinence during the falls. Uh, patient becomes pale and has sweating and flushing after the fall. Uh, falls are not associated with any uh, postural change. Patient has background of hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, type 2 diabetes. What is the most pro uh, appropriate investigation that you would do uh, further? To, to, to find out the underlying cause. So key thing being you need to find out the underlying cause. I mean, you would do ideally you would do all of these investigation, but which is the most appropriate one for finding the most likely underlying cause. OK, so we just open the poll. Yeah. We've got quite a lot of people going for A. OK. OK, so we are trying to find out the most likely mm. underlying cause. Shall I move on? Or yeah. do you want me to wait? Yeah, no, we can stop that there. OK, OK, so most common, um, I mean, the first investigation for underlying cause is Holter ECG. So as I mentioned that the key thing being to find the underlying cause, uh, so CT had definitely very important, uh, but it's, uh, the, as the question says, is underlying cause. So most likely cause in this case is an arrhythmia, possibly a bradyarrhythmia. So what gives that away? So first of all, loss of consciousness. Um, so loss of consciousness and then again becoming uh, pale, having flushing after the falls, having sweating after the falls. Uh, this corresponds to the adrenal uh, adrenal rush after the falls, which is basically because of uh, body compensating when uh, not getting proper blood supply, uh, brain not getting proper blood supply. So you'll do an Holter ECG to find out um, the arrhythmia. OK. Um, so what are the differentials for falls? So so as I said, very good history is very important. And for during the falls, you need to ask if there was a loss of consciousness. So if there was a loss of consciousness, it could be syncope, it could be seizures, it could be uh, dizziness, it could be arrhythmias, as I mentioned, uh, bradycardia as being the most common ones. Um, AF can also cause falls. And uh, if there's no loss of consciousness, then it's basically a drop attack, which means that it's likely that their uh, legs gave away, or there's uh, uh, no hampering to the blood supply to the brain, if that makes sense. 
So it could be cardiovascular, it could be carotid sinus disease, which is basically um, vagal uh, stimulation and uh, TIAs, um, orthostatic hypo hypotension. Okay. okay, so how would you manage that, uh, manage the faults? Um, so strength and balance training. So first of all, we need to rule out the cause and treat the cause, but after the cause is treated, as I said, that in most of the patients, even after the cause is treated, they are still prone to falls uh, because of the weakness, because of the fear of falling again. Um, yeah, so you do strength and balance training. Home has an uh, assessment and intervention. This is something that's done by our colleagues in physiotherapy and occupational therapy. Uh, medication review, very important as I mentioned. Um, cardiac pacing, if indicated. Uh, visual assessment. So many of the times a patient is admitted and we would investigate thoroughly and would find out nothing because what we are doing is doing bloods, CT head and everything, but won't find anything and a simple ocular exam might reveal some cot uh, cataract or some uh, cause because um, if you see patients in a &E, you you'll be able to appreciate that most of the elderly are not able to give a very good history so you either get a collateral which I mean may not be very reliable so you need to depend on your examination findings so education so after you found out found out the cause treated the cause you need to um, tell patients how to uh, cope with the phones so as i mentioned that if you have a fall previously you are prone to have another fall so just being ignorant and saying that we've treated it it won't happen again doesn't help you need to tell the patient what happened what to do if this happens again uh, what are the changes they are willing to make and motivation very important from physiotherapy point of view and uh, measures to prevent falls for example avoiding stairs so providing them with a stair lift and or uh, installing some handrails to prevent falls in the house yeah and some 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 falls might be preventable for example uh, take postural drop uh, so you see that there's a, there are medications which might cause postural drop but you absolutely can't stop the medication. For example, patients on bisoprolol and have got uh, um, an AF and you can't stop bisoprolol. It's giving them a postural drop. So so what do you do? So you tell the patient how to cope with it. So for example, just um, getting up slowly when they stand. It's just one example to uh, prevent the, some preventable causes of fall. OK, OK, any questions till now about falls? Yeah, we might have a question in the chat. That's OK. Why don't you why don't you keep going and um, we can cover that in. Oh. Hang on. OK. Oh, no, it's fine. No, carry on. OK. Uh, next topic, frailty. So yeah, what is frailty? Basically, when we say frailty, we think of just the medical part, but it's not just the medical or physical dimension. It's psych a psycho psychological and social dimension as well. For what what does that mean exactly? For example, a patient can have no comorbid comorbidities but still be frail. For example, living alone, needing help with ADLS, um, having no uh, psychological support, basically living alone or having problems with the memory. So even that patient would be frail, even though uh, they have um, no physical health issues. For example, when I started my foundation, yeah, I, I, I remember I saw a patient and, and my consultant said clinical frailty score of six and I could see the patient just had dementia and no cardiac problem, no lung problem, and I was very confused. Like, why, why is this gentleman play, play? So what we failed to look at is the psychological and social dimension, which is basically he was living alone and uh, having problems with the memory, which uh, made him more prone to all the uh, frailty and all the elderly, um, I mean, common conditions in elderly. 
OK, so this is the clinical frailty scale and you will be needing it a lot in your uh, foundation year and also uh, possibly in exams as well. Uh, so. Anything above six is I mean, we say mo moderate to severe frailty, which is basically uh, they might need some help to stop either the disease. Uh, I mean, stop uh, their frailty from progressing or if they are at eight or nine, we need to start thinking about end of life and how we can make them comfortable rather than stopping the frailty. So one is very fit, which is basically people like uh, I mean, people who can do everything just like uh, us. I mean, uh, like young people and well is basically no active disease, but when they do exercise, they get uh, tired or they are not able to manage exercise as well as they used to. Managing well is basically is they have some medical problems, mm. but they are not uh, causing any problems to their uh, ADLS and uh, daily activities. So vulnerable, these are people who are not dependent on anybody, but they do have medical conditions that are limiting their uh, daily activities. So mildly frail, so these are the people who are just. The borderline people and we really need to uh, think think in the future or plan uh, for them because uh, these are the ones who will be moving to six very quickly if not managed very well. So these are having evidence slowing and need help with high order ADLS. What the, uh, does that mean? For example, any heavy work at home, finances, um, medication, and but still these people are able to manage uh, everything on their own except from the heavy work. So moderately frail. So these people need uh, help with everything for example keeping the house uh, help with bathing uh, might need some uh, minimal assistance while dressing as well so severely frail are completely dependent these are the people who have uh, four times package of care uh, and which means basically they have carers coming four times a day or they have a, a full time carer every day day and night and very severely uh, uh, frail uh, um, people are the ones who are completely dependent and approaching the end of life uh, and basically when they get any illness even a minor one they might not recover from that terminally terminally ill these are uh, the clinical frailty scale of nine uh, these are people who have got a, a terminal condition and we know they might not recover from this and life expectancy is not more than six six months so yeah so important ones to remember are uh, five, six, seven, and eight, because basically nine you'll be able to tell definitely. Uh, so what it's difficult to uh, differentiate is five, six, and seven. Okay, so mild frailty. So mild frailty would be anything uh, until five or six. I mean between five uh, up till six. So these are aging well, limited progression. They're keeping active, healthy. Uh, so 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 we need to do. Um, we need to keep them uh, active, uh, healthy weight management. Avoid smoking. Uh, explain them what frailty. Is. So as I mentioned, jumping from five to six is a very fine line. So education about frailty is very important. Uh, and self management. So what is moderate frailty? So as I mentioned from six, seven and eight would be moderate frailty and uh, they need MDT assessment, identify and uh, support and caregivers. As I mentioned, they might need some someone with clinical frailty of uh, seven or eight might need a full time care. So identify what's the family support like if they have any carers coming in from the council. Yeah. And uh, also need to be very uh, careful of their deterioration. As I mentioned, anybody of a clinical frailty score of eight might just have a minor illness and may not recover. So be very alert to even a minor minor illness for them. For example, just a flu, they might not recover from the flu. OK, uh, severe frailty. So as I mentioned for clinical frailty scale of nine, it's basically end of life care, making them more comfortable. So we don't actively treat them. We make make sure that 
active treatment doesn't cause. I mean, we do actively treat them, but not to uh, the extent that it cause, causes them any discomfort. And our main preference is around uh, the comfort rather than the treatment. OK, so medical component of frailty. So it is cognitive impairment, uh, cognitive assessment, uh, appropriateness of disease based clinical guidelines, medication review, uh, identification and optimization of medical problems. Uh, so um, basically what this means is uh, first of all, cognitive is, uh, assessment. Why is it important? First of all, to rule out dementia and also for the management as well. Uh, because they might not you you might uh, be educating them very well, but they might not be able to go home and replicate everything. So so yeah, very important to identify cognitive uh, impairment and uh, disease based clinical guidelines. So sometimes we do over treat the diseases. So just because the guidelines say so use your clinical judgment um, based on frailty, for example, um, an 85 year old might not need, even though their cure risk is very high, they, they might not need a statins uh, because there's no no long term benefit that you can see in them in, in that and they'll be just taking the medication and even though their life expectancy may be uh, five, five years or less than 10 years. And so there's no actual benefit in taking statins uh, for for someone, even though their cure risk is very high. OK. Um, identification and optimization of medical problems. So as I mentioned, if you even see a, a minor problem like flu, just uh, treat that and be wary that it could get uh, worse. OK, uh, individualized uh, care and support uh, support plan. So very important uh, that we, as I mentioned previously as well, not to follow just the guidelines blindly and individualize the plan. Uh, so we need to have their psychological history. We need to have their social history and what they think, how motivated they are to uh, prevent going into a higher frailty scale and anticipating uh, that they might be uh, going from clinical frailty of six to seven so anticipating that and making plans around that and doing a comprehensive assessment we'll talk about a comprehensive assessment in detail in a bit okay so the next question um elderly gentleman admitted to the hospital as the wife is not able to cope with the patient so very common uh, presentation uh, your registrar on the frailty team asks you to assess the patient and scale the patient according to the rockwood clinical frailty score uh, collateral from the wife. The patient is usually confused, not oriented to time, place and person, background of dementia, uh, hypertension, type 2 diabetes. Uh, wife and daughter usually bathe and dress the patient. Uh, patient has um, OD package of care, so basically he has carers coming in once a day. Uh, but otherwise the patient is medically well, no respiratory or urinary symptoms. What is the frailty score? So just uh, open the poll there. OK, so we've got a couple of people going for C, <clears throat> mm -hmm. some going for B. OK, OK, so C is the correct answer. So as you can see, there is slow. I mean, for clinical frailty score of six, there needs to be a slowing, but they don't need to be dependent. So here the patient is dependent for daily activities as well. So you can see clinical frailty of seven and not eight basically because eight would be uh, probably QDS package of care. I mean four times package of care or having a hundred percent carer or having a comorbidity uh, and being so frail that even minor, minor illness might just tip them over to the clinical frailty of nine. So comprehensive uh, geriatric assessment. So this is basically if you work in a frailty team uh, when you when you uh, are are in uh, when you are in your geriatric uh, rotation, 
So this is the most common thing you do. Uh, frailty in older people. Uh, so person recognized. So as as uh, the registrar would recognize or the A&E would recognize that this patient is frail and ask you to assess. Assess so holistic, multi-dimensional, uh, interdisciplinary, diagnostic and therapeutic pro process. So uh, how is it therapeutic process as well? So when you assess uh, what what kind of uh, social support they have that is also used in the management plan. For example, if you uh, take a very good history and you find out, uh, you try to call the patients next of kin, try to find out where they live, what's the social support like. You develop a repo and you can use that when you devise your management plan that patient, have, for example, a patient has a daughter and daughter works as this, cannot be a full time carer or can be a full time carer. So yeah. Uh, the assessment is basically therapeutic as well. So. As we discussed, um, the different components of uh, frailty, social, psychological, uh, medical and functional needs, uh, development of an integrated plan to meet all these needs. Yeah. OK, so what are the different domains? Uh, medical and functional, so when we assess, we go in for the medical domain. For example, patient having multiple comorbidities, uh, having mm, uh, eight to ten medications prescribed, uh, check the patient's weight, and um, also very important thing is weight and nutrition. Sometimes it is overlooked, and sometimes it. I mean, the people are fixated just on weight and nutrition. For example, you might have an um, elderly lady or a per, uh, person being uh, very uh, under nutrition, but otherwise they might be functionally very well. I mean, doing their ADLS independently, uh, you know, com comorbidities. Uh, so people just on the basis of looks might say this patient is very frail, but it's not just the weight and nutrition. It is a, um, a multidimensional uh, domain, medical, functional and psychological. So yeah, uh, check for continence, vision and hearing, advanced care pl planning. Oh yeah, continence also also very important. Uh, people may be bladder or bowel incontinent, and this one one makes them prone to other medical condition, but also uh, needs to be assessed very early on so we can make a management plan. For example, someone who's very frail might be bladder incontinent but not, might not be the best candidate for a catheter so it's very important to uh, assess um, what kind of social support they have if they need a catheter or who the, do they need a diaper or what what, what we can uh, do to help them socially as well as medically um, functional gait and balance falls risk uh, transfer and mobility uh, so Transfer and mobility is basically if they are able to get up from the sofa to the uh, bed or sofa to the chair or chair to the bed. And how do they do that? Do they need assistance of one? Are they able to do it independently? Do they need some type of devices or uh, equipment for that? Okay. Personal ADLS, instrumental ADLS and advanced ADLS. So personal ADLS is basically um, bathing, washing, eating. Instrumental ADLS is basically um, using some frame or sticks or anything uh, like that. Advanced ADLS is, for example, cleaning the house, doing their finances and something advanced. So very important when you take a, a good geriatric history, you need to ask um, how much the patient can do by themselves. OK, um, other two domains, psychological, uh, the mood, the co cognition, what they're able to uh, understand and ideas, concerns and expectations. Uh, social and environmental history, very important. Uh, what type of support they have? Do they have any equipments at home? Do they have stairs at home? Do they have carpets at home? Are the carpets loose? So this all basically you can get it from the patient who is well like clinical frailty score of five or but this is usually better better uh, available from the collateral history. So when you take history from next of kin. OK, uh, social circumstances uh, that need to be considered. OK, 
uh, right from the admission uh, till uh, so. So what what we need to do is once an elderly patient comes to the hospital. Once you see them in a &E, you need to start thinking about uh, how you're going to safely discharge them. It's, it's not only because of uh, the pressures or NHS or pressure on beds, but it is basically because of the patient. We'll discuss this uh, a bit later that being in hospital itself is a very, um, I mean, debilitating thing for the patient. It leads to falls, it causes uh, immobility, muscle weakness, and we'll talk about this later as well, but 11% uh, of elderly people and need rehabilitation, so you can see it's a big number. Uh, given that some people might just be admitted for one or two days, even though and they, they might need some rehabilitation, so need to be considered right from the uh, beginning that like what are the social circumstances of the patient and how we can resolve them so that we are medically as well as socially treating the patient. So what package of care they have? Who is the main carer? Very important. So patient might so what happens usually we take when we take a good history we are like the patient has qds package of care and we are done like patient has four times care but there has to be someone who has been taking who has been managing this all who has been taking care of uh, this all who's the make could be a daughter could be a friend could be a neighbor very important to identify the main carer who are the family members where do they live how often they can visit living situation house do they live in a house or a flat so I was very confused in the beginning. Why do we ask this question? But very important because whatever we do on discharge, this is the most important thing because patient might be medically fit, but you send them home. They live in a house. Their bathroom is upstairs. They you discharge them today. In the evening, they go to the toilet and have another fall. So it's very important to identify if they, it's a house and if the house has everything at one level if there are stairs we need to consider a stair lift and if it is a flat what level the flat is on um is there a lift do they need to have uh or, or go go through the stairs to the flat and do a stair assessment so what is stair assessment basically our uh, phys physiotherapy colleagues uh, try to assess how well the patients are managed uh, able to manage the stairs so rehab principles so yeah uh 11 percent percent of uh, older people are referred to rehabilitation, which is a big, big number. Uh, increasing geriatric population uh, increase uh, and the apparent increase in uh, disability related to musculoskeletal disorders, depression, mental health again, uh, diabetes, neurological disorders is affecting mobility related activities in particular, which is causing the increased need for rehabilitation. OK, so what do we focus on? So functional activity to maintain their functional mobility and capability, improvement of balance through exercise and functional uh, programs, uh, ambulation with good direction and elevation changes, uh, reaching activities, uh, good nutrition and general care, social and emotional support. So this is more of a MDT approach rather than a medical approach. So rehabilitation we do need to give the our inputs as doctors in this but this is mostly taken care of by ot's and physiotherapies and the which comprises the multidisciplinary team so foundations um so it is discussed on the seven principles totality of the patient individual totality basically uh, psychological physical and social uh we need to treat the patient as to, uh, total uh, individualization. So as we talked about, not just blindly following the guidelines, but individualizing the plan intensity. Some people might be able to uh, tolerate more intense activities, but some might not be. So just keep that in mind. Specific sequencing, very important to uh, you know, sequence things. For example, getting out of bed, uh, uh, independently before we start to mobilize them with assistance, if that makes sense. OK, compliance and how compliant the patient is. Sometimes patient might be delirious, not being able to, uh, I mean, uh, tolerate the physiotherapy or any uh, rehabilitation we are offering. So there's no use of offering it until the uh, time patient is compliant because 
it might be just the waste of uh, resources as well as um, uh, energy and we might think that the, we've done this 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 and but the patient is not compliant and by the time we go to the next step we haven't done the first step so yeah timing avoid aggravation yeah so when there's a delirious patient do not force anything on them just let them be um, mentally stable first before starting on to intensive rehab so mdt what does the mdt uh, comprise of so as as we may have talked about um, rehab is basically by the mdt and not by the individual medical team so it comprises of medical teams which is the doctors and the nurses occupational therapy uh, so what is occupational therapy team this is the team that uh, manages uh, um, you know how well we can discharge, how safely we can discharge the patient. When we discharge the patient, they have a look at their house. They have a look, look uh, what physical support they have, what equipments they need. For example, they might need an equipment to transfer them from bed to the sofa. They might need a stair lamp. So this is all taken care of by the occupational therapy team. This might be very important because when you start working on the wards, um, you see occupational therapists and physiotherapists and you really don't know the difference. So. Um, yeah, so I was told I, I asked one of my colleagues, what's the difference? One of my occupational therapy colleagues uh, about what's the difference between between occupational therapist and a physiotherapist. So it was a very good answer. So what she said was, an occupational therapist helps you to get into your shoes, but a physiotherapist helps you to walk or dance, if that makes sense. So occupational therapy will uh, provide you with equipment and uh, tell you how to use it, help you how to use it. But the physiotherapy is the team which uh, which will tell you uh, about your physical mobility and how to do your ADLS. So community nursing team, uh, for example, Elderly people might have some bed sores, might need some dressing, might need some insulin uh, medication. So community nursing team comes into play at that time. Complex discharge team. So this team takes, uh, uh, I mean, this team takes over uh, the discharge when, uh, for example, we think that the patient might be able to go home, but the relatives might think, or, or the, uh, uh, I mean, they might, or the patient might think that it's not safe for them to go home or we think that it's it's not safe for them to go home and uh, the patient thinks it might be. So basically, wherever there is a clash, the complex discharge team comes in and finds a way out. Social services, uh, these are the people who are involved with safeguarding and uh, take care on uh, uh, basically the community stuff, how safe, how safe the patient is at home uh, after you've discharged them and rehab assessment team. So this is the team of uh, this team may be based at the hospital, may be based at the rehab centers. They when you refer someone to the uh, rehab centers, they come and do an assessment if they'll be a good candidate. So you might think, what does it mean? A good candidate, for example, the patient might be uh, needs to be compliant, needs to be able to understand everything and needs to be, I mean, clinical frailty. I mean, this is not not the absolute rule, but uh, clinical frailty of uh, around seven and not not basically eight because we need to find something that is reversible. But that being said, it's absolutely not the rule that clinical frailty of eight cannot go to uh, a, a rehab. OK, immobility. Now, any questions till now? No, at the moment. OK. OK, so on to our next topic, immobility. So uh, hazards of immobility. So these are the different systems uh, that immobility impacts on. Most important being the musculoskeletal system, which is the most common, which is known to everyone. But there's also effect on all the other systems as well. So decrease lung volume, obviously, because you're not uh, Work, um, working that much, uh, decrease oxygen saturation, aspiration, very common, atelectasis, um, gastrointestinal system, reflux, very common uh, in patients, especially in patients when uh, with prolonged admission, musculoskeleton, um, I think. Oh, 
Letitia, I think you've just frozen there. Hi, Ellie. Can you Hi hear me? There. Yeah, that's it. I can hear you again now. OK, great. OK, so psychological, uh, mental health, circulatory system and genital urinary system. OK, so use an elderly friendly approach. What does that mean? Uh, so senior friendly approach, removing any barriers, for example, non-compliance or uh, if there's some uh, hearing problem in the patient, uh, hearing aids, providing education to the staff and the patients uh, and the caregivers. Uh, emotional and behavioral uh, environment and very important is ethics in clinical care and research. Uh, and uh, physical environment. OK, I think that's it. Any questions? Ali, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah no, I don't think there's any questions. Yes, That's yes. great. Thank you. Um, so brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, if we can get you to fill in the feedback form, that would be really helpful. Um, and as I say in the first slide, if you want to contact us about any of our sessions, um, please do drop us an email. Uh, thanks very much, Matish. Thank you. OK.